Hi everyone. Today's recorded lecture is going to be on the first part of our invertebrates chapter. This first part is going to be the early diverging animals or the animal lineages that appear or evolved before the clade Bilateria. So we're going to cover Periphera, Tenophora, and Cnidaria in this lecture today. Before we continue with the lecture, I want to point out some of the things you should have handy. We've got our lecture outline, which includes an introduction to all of the things that you're going to need to know about each animal phylum. And after that, we've got the lecture outline, which is what you can use to take notes as we go through the lecture. My suggestion is going to be that after we lecture over each animal phylum, pause the recorded lecture and then fill in the information associated with that phylum before continuing on to the next one. The other thing you should have handy is the summary chart right here. At, um, with each phylum, when we discuss the body plan information, I'll immediately go to this chart and we can start filling in these squares here over the type of symmetry the animal phylum has, the number of tissue layers, the body cavity type, and the type of development. So have these two things ready as you go through and take your notes. Okay, so let's start with the phylum periphera. The phylum periphera includes all of the animals that we call sponges. So sponges are not just items that you have to clean your kitchen sink or your bathroom counter, they're actual living animals. And we've got the body plan information. So sponges are asymmetrical. They do not have symmetry. And they lack true tissues. Um, this seems a little weird. They do have, since we said that all animals have tissues, they do have specialized cell layers. And they're separated, but not by a membranous layer. They're separated by a mesohyal layer. And as such, we don't consider them to have true tissues. So let's go ahead and fill in our summary charts right here. Uh, for body plan information, I'm going to use this key right here, which has the codes for all of the different types of body plan characteristics. Periphera are asymmetrical. They don't have true tissues, so we're, I'm just going to write NA for not applicable. And these things down here, the body cavity type and the development type, these characteristics are only going to be for the bilateral triploblasts because only uh, triploblastic animals have a mesoderm tissue layer. And since the body cavity refers to whether or not there's a cavity within that mesoderm layer, only triploblasts can be one of these three types. And similarly, protostome and deuterostome are characterized by how their mesoderm forms. So these characteristics down here will be applicable only to the bilateral triploblasts, which are going to be in this clade, everything from acela down to arthropoda. And so for these two right here, we're just going to put a dashed line through there. And we will continue on with information about the phylum periphera. So according to the tree, um, they are a lineage by themselves. We call them parazoans. And this just means the clay parazoa refers to the fact that they lack true tissues compared to you metazoa, which have true tissues. So that would be the higher level phylogeny. And they're the earliest diverging animal phylum. Clade is just a general term for a taxonomic lineage or a phylogenetic group. So for a group of related organisms. Sometimes I'll call it taxa, sometimes I'll call it a clade. So a phylum would be a clade. There are about 5,500 species belonging to the phylum periphera, and most or all species are hermaphroditic. What this means is that there are not separate male or female sexes. 
but rather an individual will produce both sperm and egg gamete cells. They are sessile, and this means that they are attached to a fixed spot. Because they're sessile, that means they are not planktonic. Planktonic would be the opposite, where they are suspended or floating in the water. So sessile means they are attached and they don't move. They are also suspension feeders, which means that they filter out particles from the water and then um, ingest those food particles as they pass through the body of the animal. So the opposite of a suspension feeder or a different mode of feeding would be through predation or attacking and eating prey. And sponges are aquatic animals as opposed to terrestrial. So they are aquatic and they're found in both marine and freshwater environments. So the last thing to cover are the major parts of a sponge and what their functions are. Um, so let's start with um, how food is ingested. First, uh, food particles are going to enter the body of the animal through pores. So we get the influx of water and food particles suspended in that water through a pore. And then these cells right here, these are called collar cells or coanocytes. So coanocytes, these are the cells that resemble the coanoflagellates. The colloquial term for them is a collar cell. So this little collar cell has a flagellum and this flagellum beats and it draws water into the cell and food particles or these little red dots, food particles are ingested by phagocytosis. So we have the ingestion of, of food particles through phagocytosis. And then within these collar cells, um, the food particles are broken down by intracellular digestion. So intracellular means within the cells. The food's not digested in this cavity. The food is digested within the cells that line the cavity. This cavity is called the spongocele. So if you recall, seal means cavity. So we've got the cavity within a sponge. That's called the spongocele, and then the um, flow of the water goes out through the osculum. All right, we have these other types of cells that are called amoebocytes. These um, cells are really interesting. They have two different functions. One is that they can carry nutrients to other cells. Like amoeba, they can move by pseudopodia. And they're also similar to stem cells in that they can develop into other cell types on an as-need basis. So while there's no circulatory or respiratory system, the amoebocytes do function to circulate nutrients. All right, so now that we've covered everything in the phylum periphera, I do want to show you just once how I would fill out my lecture notes. So after we finish the phylum information. Go to your lecture outline and fill out everything that you've learned in this order. And so body plan, we learned that they are asymmetrical. So that means no symmetry and they have no true tissues. Common name we call members of the phylum periphera sponges. Higher taxonomy means what clades or taxa does the phylum periphera belong to? So at the very highest level, we have the domain level. Um, and the three domains are archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. So periphera, of course, belong to the domain eukarya, as all animals do. And all animals belong to the kingdom metazoa. So that would be the kingdom level taxonomy. And then the sponges belong to that clade or that lineage, parazoa, or all of the animals with no true tissues. 
we had 5,500 species. And we didn't learn any lower level clades, but some examples were the glass sponges. Glass sponges have silica in their spicules, and the calcium carbonate um, sponges are called the calcarium sponges. All right, as far as lifestyle and ecology and reproduction, what I have in my notes, um, for this, go ahead and take a look at your lecture outline. Um, in the introduction, it says for lifestyle, ecology, and reproduction, are these species hermaphroditic or do they have separate male-female sexes? So we can answer that question and say they are hermaphroditic. So individuals are not male or female. They produce both sperm and egg gamete cells. Now, this is still a type of sexual reproduction, so we don't have any form of asexual reproduction listed for the members of the phylum periphera. Next on our list says, can the um, animals reproduce asexually? And the answer is no, or at least not that we've noted. Are individuals aquatic or terrestrial? And if they are aquatic, are they sessile or planktonic? Do they swim? Are they marine or freshwater? Are they predators or filter feeders? And if they are worms, which sponges are not, are they parasitic or free living? So we'll fill in that information here. Um, they are aquatic and they can be both marine and freshwater. They are sessile, which means they are attached to a fixed spot. And because they're attached to a fixed spot and they have no mechanism for movement or motility, they would make really bad predators. As such, they are not predators, they are filter feeders. Or um, I should say they are suspension feeders. For the body structure and function, for the digestion, we can summarize this as intracellular digestion by those choanocytes. Um, following phagocytosis by those choanocytes. Cat, my esteemed coworker. That's a term, so I'm going to underline that. There's no respiratory system. Uh, instead, gases uh, just are exchanged by diffusion. There is no circulatory system either, but the amoebocytes that we learned about, I don't know if I'm spelling that right, can carry nutrients around to other cells. All right, and then other notable structures, we talked about the path of water flowing through the sponge. So water flowed through the pores into that cavity, which was called the spongocele. And then it flowed out through the top of the sponge, which was called the osculum. So those are some other anatomical structures that we would find in the sponge. All right, hopefully that helps guide you as you take your notes throughout this lecture. Listen, pause, record. So next we've got the phylum Tenophora. Uh, tenophores, along with the cnidarians, which we'll learn about next, are diploblasts with radial symmetry. I'm gonna go ahead and pause there. We're gonna continue filling out our charts. So here we are now in the clade Eumetazoa, and we've got the cnidarians and the 
cnidarians and the tenophores. The C is silent. And both of these organisms are radial diploblasts. Because they're diploblasts, that means they don't have a mesoderm tissue layer. Because they have no mesoderm, they cannot have a body cavity within that mesoderm, and they cannot be either protostomes or deuterostomes. So we're going to leave that blank. And I'm also going to cross out the rows that we are not going to cover. So we're not going to talk about acela. We won't talk about the hemichordates. We are also going to be skipping the ectoprocta and the brachiopoda. And I think that's it. So we're going to be covering the rest of these as we go through with the other parts of this lecture. But we're going to continue on with some of the other information about the tenophores and the nidarians. All right. So tenophores. For that higher phylogeny, you um, want to note that tenophores are the first lineage within that clade eumetazoa. So they belong to the clade metazoa, then eumetazoa. The diversity is quite low, it's only a hundred species, and they are hermaphroditic, meaning they don't have separate male-female sexes. They are planktonic, which means instead of attached, they are in the water column. I should say they are aquatic. Um, they're found only in marine environments, however. So they're aquatic in marine environments, and they are planktonic, and yes, they do swim. They have these ciliated tentacle-like structures that are called cones. And so the cilia helps them prepare or swim. All right. They are predatorial. They eat prey or they attack and eat prey in marine environments. And the body, I don't have much in your notes about the body structure and function um, of, a nid sorry, of a tenophore because they're pretty similar to cnidaria. So because they're similar to cnidaria, whatever you learn about cnidaria, also apply that to the tenophores. So cnidaria, again, um, just like the tenophores are radial diploblasts. They are also one of the early diverging clades within the clade Eumetazoa. And there are going to be four classes, which we can list them now, but we're going to go into more detail on each of them later. Uh, these four classes are going to include the Scyphozoa, which are the jellyfish, the Hydrozoa, which are Hydra and the Portuguese men of war. You've got the Cubozoa, which are box jellies. And we're going to have the Anthozoa, which are sea anemone and corals. All right. They are aquatic. Um, they can be in marine or freshwater environments, depending on the class. So we'll fill that information in um, for the separate class water, or for the separate classes. Oh, diversity is 10,000 species, so much more diverse than the tenophores. Um, like the tenophores, they are also predators. And they're carnivores, which means they eat animals. All right. There are two stages in the life cycle or two major forms. The polyp form is a form that is sessile or attached, and it does undergo asexual reproduce, reproduction by budding. So it's attached, and then the tentacles face up. And then a bud is an asexual reproduction. It's kind of like a little buddy. It's like a mini, mini polyp on a polyp. So a bud forms from the adult animal and just pinches or buds off. So in the polyp stage, they're attached. And the stalk is facing down and the tentacles are facing up. 
In the medusa stage, this is like what, how we would draw our typical jellyfish. In our medusa stage, the tentacles are facing down. And this stage right here is planktonic, which means it can swim along in water. So it does swim. And let's take a look um, at those four classes, um, get a little more information about them, about their lifestyle, ecology, and reproduction. So our medusazoans, these are um, the majority of the found, time found in the medusa stage. So each one of these medusa zones has a medusa stage. The typical jellyfish or jellies belong to the clade Scyphozoa or the class Scyphozoa. They're marine only and they um, are only found in this medusa stage. The cubozoans um, are the box jellies. These are much more venomous. Like the typical jellies, they are also only marine and only found in that medusa stage. Um, they're very venomous, so they got that written there. The hydrozoa, which include the hydras and the Portuguese man o' war, these are a little bit different than these two jellies right here. There are marine and freshwater species. And also, they're found in both the polyp and the medusa stages. Their life cycle includes both. And in your lab activities, you'll see some hydra with the buds coming off um, in that asexual type of reproduction. Our sea anemones and corals, these are marine only. They belong to the clade Anthozoa, and this is the only class within the phylum Cnidaria that is completely sessile or attached, and they're found only in that polyp stage. They're still uh, predators, though, because they have the tentacles sticking up, so they can still reach out and grab food. So one thing that we're noting here with these tentacles in the tenophores and in the Cnidaria is um, they have the ability to move, so they've got muscle and nervous tissue. They can move and therefore they can capture food and this is what makes them good predators. So whether they're sessile or swimming, they still have those tentacles to help capture food. So in order to be a good predator, you need to have some form of ability to move, which will include muscle tissue and good sensory, and a sensory system. All right, for the Cnidarian, we're gonna learn about the basic parts. Uh, for the digestive system, we have a gastrovascular cavity and this gastrovascular cavity is a digestive compartment or cave. That has only one opening. And we call this opening, cleverly, the mouth slash anus. So food enters through the mouth slash anus into the gastrovascular cavity in the polyp form or the medusa form. Digestive enzymes are secreted from the cell layers that line this digestive cavity or this gastrovascular cavity and the food is digested in the cavity and then the nutrients are absorbed into the body of the animal. Because they're very thin flat animals as radial diploblasts, there's also no circulatory or respiratory system. So gases and nutrients just diffuse through the animal by diffusion. That's redundant. All right. Other important structures, of course, are the tentacles, which face up in the polyp form. And in the medusa form, the tentacles face down. That's it for the Nidarians. I hope you have a good idea for how to take notes during this lecture. We'll continue next with the clade, the bilateria, and our next lecture will be over the Lophotrochozoa. So that will be 
up next. All right, I will see you all then.